Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, Kai Vetter, I'm a physicist. As a matter of fact, I'm a nuclear physicist. So we deal with radiation all the time, me, my students, and my scientists. So we're exposed to and volunteer to work with radiation. So we know quite a bit about radiation. Um, so that's why the first question is not really serious. I mean, it's more addressing uh, um, and maybe some of the questions you might have about how can we see radiation? Because we believe we can see radiation very well with our sensors and our detectors we develop and improve all the time. What is so really is a scientific question uh, we are also not able to answer fully is how harmful is radiation, particularly at low dose when you have a small amount of radiation over time. What is the effect? So this is really the scientific question we need to answer, we're trying to answer. Now, when we talk about radiation, of course, we cannot uh, uh, ignore what happened more than four years ago now in Fukushima in Japan. As a result of the Northeastern earthquake, enormous earthquake resulting in tsunami, uh, and then uh, taking down uh, three of the four uh, reactors at the Daiichi nuclear power plant in Fukushima, um, leading to explosion, core meltdown, and to significant releases of radioactive material into the atmosphere, into the local environment, into the atmosphere. Enormous impact uh, socially, politically, economically, locally predominantly, but also globally. I mean, politically, as we all know, in, as enormous impact uh, due to Fukushima. The question is, what really happened in terms of the health impact due to the radiation? And the answer is, well, I would get to that uh, in, a, in a second at the end. Um, but before I do that, a few words to explain what radiation we are talking about here. Um, because we are talking about nuclear radiation, that means radiation which is uh, originated from the atomic nucleus. And because the atomic nucleus is a strongly bound entity, also the, the radiation emitted is high energy. That means if you now plot the electromagnetic spectrum, um, capturing the different types of waves we are exposed to naturally or electively, we go from radio waves, long wavelengths, low energy, uh, to uh, visual light, of course, the, uh, which we can sense very well. Of course, that's what our eyes are for. Uh, also, infrared, we can sense, so we can actually feel it um, by, the, by the heat. And then we go up in energy to the X-rays, and then ultimately to gamma rays. And one of the challenges there, of course, is for, for us that we are not able to feel it. So we don't really understand what is our environment and what will be the impact of the radiation, uh, the nuclear radiation around us. Specifically, we are talking about ionizing radiation. So ion a radiation that is able to ionize uh, atoms or molecules. That means it can remove or knock out electrons out of the orbitals of, of our atoms or molecules. So the, the, the interaction is quite different than the interaction to do this radiation which we have to be aware of. Therefore, also in terms of the effects, might be a little different than the effects here. On the other hand, in terms of detection, that might be very helpful to actually help uh, to use the ionizing, the, the characteristic of the ionizing radiation to detect. Now, one word about radioactivity and radiation, um, just to, for clarification. So radioactivity fundamentally just means the transformation of a nucleus from an unstable uh, um, configuration to a more stable configuration. So unstable to stable, and it can, in, to, to go to the more stable configuration, it emits radiation. And, and Ernest Rutherford, already in 1908, so more than 100 years ago, recognized that there are two, three different types of radiation, alpha decay or alpha radiation, beta decay and beta uh, uh, radiation, and gamma radiation. And they're all a little different. Uh, and they do uh, interact differently, therefore can be also stopped and attenuated differently. Alpha particle, sheet of paper. Beta particle, you'd need just your hand or a piece of aluminum. Gamma rays are very penetrating. So if you want to probe and detect some uh, uh, nuclear material in your environment, gamma radiation might be useful because it allows you to detect it in some distance, for example. And then we have neutrons, which I'll not talk about. In. So that's about radioactivity. Again, the fact that, we can, that, uh, that uh, uh, nuclei are not stable, they emit radiation and we can characterize a different type of radiation. Now, what about the world we're living in? Okay, so what is normal in the world in terms of radiation, specifically nuclear radiation? Uh, alpha, beta, or gamma radiation. So what is shown here is a pie chart reflecting the different sources of, of radiation we're exposed to in the United States on average, on a daily basis, pretty much. What is interesting that half of the radiation we're exposed to is due to natural sources. 
particular what we call primordial sources. That means uranium, thorium, potassium, which have been created maybe billions of years ago in, a nova, in supernova react, uh, uh, reaction, supernova events, uh, creating the heaviest elements. And their half-life, that means they live for a long time until they decay and emit some radiation. So they have been with us for billions of years, and they will be with us for billions of years. So this is about half of the radiation we exposed. Now, the other half is medical. Uh, and that really has changed over the last 10 years. Uh, medical procedures, specifically if you look at computer tomography. So enhanced uh, quite a bit uh, more use over the last 10 years, 15 years, uh, now 24%. But overall, medical is about half of the total exposure. So not that we really care too much about units and numbers, but it's, uh, it's whatever number, 6.3 millisievert. So that's per year. That's the dose rate for a US citizen in average. Now, if you go to other places in the world, particularly in India and Iran, uh, Ramza, for example, Iran, it goes up to 250 millisieverts. So a factor of 50 uh, um, or so, a factor of 40 higher than we are exposed to on average. So 40, a factor of 40 higher. That's interesting. Also, uh, some more elective exposures. And I always mention with my students, I mean, what is interesting, that we all are radioactive. We have also potassium. We have carbon-14 in us. That means if you're close to another person, we will be exposed from the radioactivity from the other person. And as a matter of fact, you can measure it, how much it is, <laughs> which is whatever 0.01 in whatever strange units. But you can measure it. And what is most important, it's not zero. Okay? In our universe, zero radiation is not possible. Okay? There's everywhere, in our, in, at least in our universe. Has been in the past and will be in the future. Also, what is really Im important, radiation and ultimately biological effects do not care where it's coming from, whether it's from the natural source or a non-natural source. Okay? It does not matter. Gamma ray is a gamma ray, beta gamma uh, ray is a beta, gamma, uh, beta ray. For example, uh, bismuth-214, which is uh, natural occurring, is very similar uh, to the man-made uh, uh, cesium-134, cesium-137, which is the signature for Fukushima. So at the end, the effect will be very similar. The, we don't care about the origin. So that's really two important messages we have to recognize. We have to, nothing else, that's the takeaway message. Okay. Now, how can we see and measure radiation? Okay, that's one, of course, the first question. Now, if you look at Visual light, uh, uh, and, 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 and we, can, we have our eyes, which are extremely sensitive uh, detectors and sensors. Right? You can measure the intensity, how many photons, so like the brightness. You can measure even the energy, that means what color. And we can, of course, image it. We can localize the source of whatever, uh, of, of, of the object. Extremely powerful. Now, for our uh, radiation, gamma radiation detector, we can do very similar things. We can uh, count the number of gamma rays, we can measure the energy of the gamma ray, which is, which is a very important and powerful tool, because that allows us to distinguish the different types of radiation and their sources, different radi uh, radioisotopes. For example, whether it's cesium-134, cesium-137, or bismuth. So this allows us to distinguish about the origin or the fingerprint of, uh, of the sources. And we can also image. Our radiation detectors can be even built more sensitive than our human eye. Because the human eye at least takes about 30 photons in 30 milliseconds to actually see it. Like in, in, in for, our gamma, in for our detectors, we only need one particle. They can count each particle individually. So sensitivity is enormous, which is really a big advantage of our detectors. So we can see extremely small amounts of radiation, like single uh, rays or single particles we can see. So the in, also they can be detected before they are harmful uh, at all. So that's a very uh, imp also important message. So just that I'm not just talking sitting here in California, so I'm spending a lot of time in Fukushima trying to help to do better measurements and also help in some of the uh, issues related to the communication about trust. So I've been four times to Fukushima last year. So that was the third anniversary. I was in Fukushima City and I had my Radiation dosimeter, again, that's my radiation detector, which I have always with me, uh, and checking on the flight to see really how the radiation goes up and down <laughs> you know, on the airplane. And this is in Fukushima City one year ago. It's 0.2 microsievert per hour, what that, what that means. If you now add that over the year, it's two. So it's really the average of the United States. So if you go closer to the site, we go up to, to 80 millisievert per year. 
Okay, so it is much higher, but it's still not really that much higher than some areas in the world, right next to the Daiichi nuclear power plant. So this is what we can do with a simple dosimeter, a Geiger counter. Oh, that's just a counter. Now, if we really want to understand where the radiation is coming from, we have to, do, we have to be able to resolve all these different peaks and lines here. Because that's what we measure and what we have measured in Berkeley. One week after the releases, um, we are able to measure that with quite sophisticated instruments. And can, you can see the colored ones, that's really what we can associate with the radiation from Fukushima. And the blue ones, the black the, the, uh, the, the uh, names here, is just natural radiation. So having this device will not tell you where the radiation is coming from. You need this type of a device, which tells you really the, the individual energy, which is, can you associate with Fukushima or not. So this is not good enough. OK, going briefly back to Fukushima. And, and uh, so what have we done in Berkeley? So when it was clear there was some major releases in, of radiation, we set up our own measurements to look at air, uh, water, rainwater, and many food samples. And we continue to do that in our redwatch.berkeley.edu uh, website. You can find a lot of information about that. So we set out to do the measurements, but also then to make that measurement, these measurements to available to the public right away and engage the public in the dialogue to try not only to, to show the results, but also put the results into a context so that the public could understand that. Um, so we were able to see the increase of, for example, iodine 131 in water and then the decline. The same with cesium in local milk, up and then the decline. What is important on all these plots is kind of the reference. So this is 0.5 whatever units here is the maximum number we've ever measured in cesium 137 in milk. Now, if you look at milk, we have potassium 40 naturally. It's 50. So 50. So it's up there relative to what we have been able to measure. Yes, we are able to see it, but it's orders of magnitude less than we're normally exposed to. If you just drink milk, and obviously you want to drink milk. We have done that for in the past, and we'll certainly should do that in the future and not stop it because of the potassium 40. Um, OK, so now the question, though, is it harmful? Well, this is really a scientific question. And the answer is, well, it depends, obviously. We're scientists. Always the answer is it depends. That's what my wife is always complaining about when I answer. Um, at high dose, we know, yes, it's like with anything. At high dose, particular high dose rate, anything, is, everything is pretty much harmful. And can potentially, but what happened at low dose? So we are not sure, but we know that the risk to get cancer, the long-term effect, is really small. But we don't really know exactly what, what, what's going on at low radiation dose. Because the problem is that we have insufficient data. Now, the reason we, we, it's very difficult to, to uh, study low-dose effects is, of course, the normal cancer rate, the, just the cancer incident rate in, for humans. Right? It's not zero. It's actually 30 to 40 percent in the United States. And we are not able to distinguish the cost for cancer, whether it's radiation it used or has some other reasons. So that prevents us to do that, uh, these studies in more... Uh, more quantitatively. Now, what the regulators do, and that's really the confusing, confusing part, is assumes the, the most conservative approach, which we call the linear no threshold model. That means from the high dose effect, which is linear, they just extrapolate down to zero. And no, do not consider any effect in terms of time or duration, number of type of the subject opposed, or any, do not assume any repair or response or adaption or stimulation process in organism, which we know nature normally does, but we are not able to, to, measure, to, to um, determine that. Therefore, uh, we use the most conservative uh, approach, which is a, a, a big problem. And for us, this is really something we have to, we have to improve to better understand low-dose effects. Now, going back to uh, four years later, uh, 85,000 people are still evacuated in Fukushima. And certainly, they want to go back. But there are a lot of issues related to transport over the next 20 years out of the environment into the evacuated areas. Now, what is really the health effect? And the international agencies and commissions agree on that. The main effect is not radiation. It's psychologically, the stress, uncertainty due to the lack of information knowledge, the fear of radiation, change in lifestyle. People have to move. They were not allowed to go outside and exercise. So the, the change in lifestyle was tremendous. And therefore, the impact was tremendous. Very likely that no death can be attributed to the radiation due to Fukushima. Okay. Very important message. I feel no death can be attributed to the radiation from Fukushima. However, there are more than 1,500 deaths 
associated with the evacuation and the change in lifestyle, which is significant. Of course, now the question is, what would have happened if the, these people, hundreds of thousand people, would not have been evacuated? Let's leave them there. Get them exposure up to 70 millisievert per hour per year. Again, other areas actually able uh, this living in that environment. And in the again, the answer is well, we don't know. Right? We don't really have the scientific data yet to determine what have happened to these people when they would have stayed there. They certainly would have be more happy in terms of their environment. They had stayed in the environment and they were um, okay exercising and, and not change their lifestyle so much. So in order to address the outstanding issues, so what we have formed now is an institute for resilient communities that captures a lot of the research necessary from the assessment to the prediction to health impact and remediation. And, but coupling that into the context of education, outreach, and the public communities. And we're doing that by working with communities in Japan. So the mayor of Korema City, the largest city of Fukushima, was visiting Berkeley two weeks ago, and he spent the whole week with us to discuss how we can help them in terms of doing the work the technology development, the demonstration science, but also to establish this institute there as a trusted resource. So that's what we're trying to do, to establish an entity, this institute over in Japan as well, to help them to ultimately go back uh, to their homes and, 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 and live safe in the future. And that's pretty much it. Thank you.